Awesome. Okay, so I see people are joining. Uh, we'll get started now. Uh, my name is Omi Velasco. I'm a principal at Graphite Ventures, uh, which today I'm sure we're, you're going to hear a lot about it. I'm also the executive director at the Venture Capital Association, and together with the VCPE Student Club at the U of A, we organized this speaker series with objective to, to uh, bring more knowledge as to what venture capital is for founders, aspiring founders, uh, investors, or aspiring investors. Uh, so with that said, uh, before we get started, Craig, I think it would be fantastic if you could give us a little bit of uh, an introduction, uh, tell us about yourself and about Graphite. For sure. Um, first of all, thanks for everybody joining. I see some familiar names and faces out there. Um, my name is uh, Craig Leonard, and uh, I'm a, a general partner at Graphite Ventures. Uh, Graphite Ventures, I'll go into it a little bit later, is a seed to Series A fund. Um, my history is uh, I come from uh, originally from the United States and uh, moved up here 15 years ago to the Ontario area um, for uh, uh, a wife and a business. And so I was an entrepreneur for seven or eight years uh, in the ad tech space and then moved over to Mars Investment Accelerator Fund, which uh, had three um, fairly successful funds. And then uh, Graphite is a fourth uh, spin-out fund from the uh, Mars Investment Accelerator Fund. Awesome. Um, so Craig, you now are the host. So if you like, um, you can get started now with the presentation. Okay. That worked? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. So um, realizing that there's a lot of people on the call uh, and that uh, there's different levels of knowledge out there. I think we've got investors and companies and students and just um, maybe aspiring founders or aspiring investors. So, um, you know, I'll try, I'll try to keep it a bit down the middle uh, if we get into something that's too technical or you have questions that are too technical at the back end, we can certainly take that offline. Um, but I'm trying to go over just mostly the basics of uh, deal structures here. And also, please feel free to use the chat as well if you have questions throughout. So a bit more about uh, Graphite just to, to frame you know, what, what I do, what, what uh, Omi and I and the team do. We're a $100 million seeding per scale fund. So we do the heavy lifting, deep deep uh, entrenchment at seed uh, to structure companies properly and get a playbook in place for successful Series A. And we have a pretty, pretty high success rate of our seed funded companies going to Series A. We focus Canada wide uh, with a concentration on enterprise business to business software companies. Um, mostly digital health, fintech, prop tech, and uh, some capital efficient, efficient hardware. Building on, for those of you who saw the previous uh, sessions, um, building on something that Pat talked about, just the business of venture capital, I thought would be a good place to start. So we all have bosses, we all have customers in a sense. So when Pat was explaining that uh, if you look at how a venture capital firm is structured, it starts to lend some insight into why we do what we do and how, and why, as we get to it, structures need to you know, mitigate downside, need to provide enough returns and a return model to not only pay for what we're doing, but for our investors. And so if you look at this, um, this is just an example. You'll picture like a, a teacher who's got their pension fund with a teacher's pension uh, firm. That firm aggregates all together those pensions of those teachers, and then they make investments into a whole bunch of different categories. And one of them is venture capital. And so we will take a check from them, a larger check, like 25 million or something. And then we distribute that out to companies. And so when you're building your companies, we, we need to structure it in such a way that your returns can pay all the way back up right to that teacher who is looking to retire at some point and, uh, and grow their own pension. And so there's, there's a hierarchy in a sense, or like a value chain 
to where the investments go and the returns need to come from. And so hopefully that frames just a little bit of why we need to um, protect the money and and why our, our uh, uh, return profiles are, are such as they are and how it translates into structure. Uh, a bit more on what we do. So we, um, our investment thesis. So as a as a venture firm, we talk to that pension fund and we say, if you're going to give us some money, this is what we're promising we'll do. And so this is our investment thesis. We mitigate risk at the seed stage and have a high success rate of going to series A with those companies. And then we have access to those to those rounds uh, then for, for those that are succeeding. And so again, when you think about structure, and we'll get into it much more, we're looking to minimize the risk at seed stage, yet optimize the upside, and we're doing it alongside with founders. So a founder that is going to you know, exit at 30 million and 40 million, not, you know, not make it to the billion mark, we still want uh, that to be a successful exit for you and for us and for our LPs. And so we structure it in such a way that there is that that you know we're okay. We we can deal with a, a single, a double, a triple, and yes, we have the billion dollar home runs. But um, you know we look at it as uh, something that we that we journey alongside, and knowing that not all businesses are gonna are gonna make it to the billion dollar mark, but we don't want to just uh, discount them. Uh, then building on what Arden was talking about with uh, due diligence uh, topics, uh, he went into to, to such great detail on so many different areas of diligence and it, the nuances for each company you know, can be so, so vast that um, there's so many areas that you can dig into. But once you start getting to the end of that due diligence, these are some of the questions that start directing where you're going to structure, how you're going to structure that deal. And so you know, how much money is the is the company raising? How much do they need for 18 months of runway? And we pressure test that to see if it's you know going to make it, uh, if, if it's a viable plan, what the company will achieve in that runway, and ultimately then what what investors are going to look at that deal as it, once it gets to that profile in that 18 months, 24 months. What's the current cap table look like now? How much does the, do the founders own? How much dilution has already uh, been taken from the company. Uh, how much you know is the dilution uh, threshold that the, that the founders have? Maybe there's other owners in there. Maybe there was you know large uh, uh, investors before that came in and took too much or something. The type of traction and revenue and business model. Uh, you know this can, gets into valuation. We'll talk more about this. Um, how will fall investors value that business ultimately? So you know once again it goes down this value chain of larger investors coming in and bringing it to other stages that are beyond us and ultimately liquidity, which goes back through that value chain uh, up to uh, our LPs. And so deal structure can do a lot to align investor and company goals. Even when valuations are off, even when you know there's, there's maybe a difference of initial strategy or something, uh, the, the deal structures can bring some of those things together. So here's some of the options uh, that, that you have for levers that can be used to, to structure deals. The first is instruments. So the, the three general instruments, the most common uh, instruments that are used for venture deals in Canada are safes, which uh, the other two fellows talked about a bit, convertible to ventures, and then equity, which is actually buying a piece of the company. And then you get into economic terms. What's the minimum close amount? which is absolutely needed to, to fund this business. What's the valuation of it? Obviously, you know, how much are you buying into it for? Or what's the valuation cap if it's a safer debenture? What's the discount rate uh, to the next round if it's a safer debenture? Interest rates, dividends, um, all, all play into economic, uh, different economic terms within the instruments. And then other terms that can come uh, in, in various instruments Liquidation preference, we'll go into that one quite a bit on per preferred shares, participating preferred shares, different investor rights, again, to, to retain some of that, to mitigate some of that, that downside risk uh, early on in the investment. You know, what can an investor do to help them in the company to retain ownership and value in the company down the, down the line as it raises more money and 
you know, may or may not go according to plan. Um, some protective provisions that can also protect investors and, and founders, board structures, governance structures, um, employee stock option plans. That's just a handful. There's uh, there, there's uh, quite a few uh, that can be used, and we'll go into these and, and a few others. But um, it, it can it can people can get very creative uh, with uh, with deal structures. There's a lot of different levers. So, um, but but generally, you know, the, the idea of the structure is to find a common ground between you, your, your the company and the investor, so that you're you're marching together. You get into a long-term relationship. We'll go into that with negotiation. You know, what is that common ground that makes both parties happy, so that you're you know marching up to the same beat uh, from there. Okay, first instrument, which um, most people are somewhat familiar with, is a safe. It's it's an acronym for Simple Agreement for Future Equity. It's you know, it's basically a, a figurative handshake, as as you can see there in the in the in the pros. Um, it it's a it's an agreement uh, for a, a future participation of equity um, at a certain valuation that you define now. Uh, you don't have to define it now, but most are defined now as a valuation cap, and uh, and it converts into equity given certain triggers like sale of uh, new rounds coming in or, or or something like that. We'll go into more details on that. Um, so it's simple and fast. The pros on it are simple and fast. It, it works really well in hot markets when deals are moving fast. Um, also, when there's good confidence that you're going to that the company is going to raise again in the future at a higher valuation, um, the company can issue it themselves. Uh, they can start collecting money fast on a rolling close. Two sides to everything. The cons are that it can be open-ended and it leaves investors hanging sometimes in a IOU, uh, you know, this, this figurative handshake with, uh, and if the company's not performing, doesn't go to a next round, you're, you're basically just stuck with a piece of paper. Um, generally, there's no investor protections uh, that, that can help in uh, future rounds. Um, and then the uh, rolling close can be, you know, there's a flip side to that. The, the rolling close can, you can, we've seen this quite a bit. Um, the uh, company can issue a safe, start taking $100,000 checks toward a $2 million raise, for instance, get to 500000 Now it's anchored in terms of those terms and that and that instrument and they don't make it any further than that now the company is undercapitalized and uh, those investors that put in that 500,000 are at risk so an overview and uh, general terms of a safe so uh, many of you know the the safe started at y combinator um to address their high volume of quick seed rounds, they're an accelerator, and so they basically take equity in each each company that comes in through their program. And so, just to avoid legal costs and to standard terms that they offer, um, they just did this 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 safe um, and they invented it. It's similar to convertible note, but it does not create debt. And uh, again, it works best when there's high confidence of the next raise at a higher valuation. There's essentially three forms of it. Uh, there's a safe with a valuation cap and no discount to the next round, discount with no valuation cap, and then there's a valuation cap with a discount. Uh, I think most common you see valuation caps uh, and a discount. So a valuation cap entitles the investors to convert into equity at a lower, at the lower of a valuation cap or the price of the next round. So you have a $10 million cap, the next round is 20 million. The, the investor still converts at that 10 million. Um, if, if the next round is 8 million, then the, the investor converts at, at 8 million uh, valuation. And so it protects the investor from a valuation increase, but it also lowers the price during uh, if investors convert at a round that's lower uh, than that cap. And so that's one thing that's interesting. Uh, some investors don't really love safes. We don't. We don't really love them all that much, just because they're um, like to to shape our companies a little bit more uh, toward what they'll expect at Series A, 
Um, but one of the good things that's come, I mean, for investors' standpoint, uh, the good thing that's come from this hot market that was just recent, where safes were being issued by companies and being fulfilled at high valuations, they'll reprice themselves, um, you know, for good or bad. And so it's it's a risk to founders. Again, when it's a hot market and you know that there's going to be, you have real good confidence that there's going to be a higher round on the other side, go for it. Um, but you may end up having a lower valuation at that next round um, and taking dilution that you didn't didn't really expect uh, to take. Discount rate effectively provides an incentive uh, for bone uh, for uh, participating investors to convert uh, into uh, into the equity. Um, normal ranges are fifteen to thirty percent the conversion uh, to the conversion price. Um, some conversion triggers, like what actually makes a safe become converted into equity, usually it's a financing. So a next round of equity, uh, you may define it as once the company raises another. $2 million or $3 million, then all of the previous safe holders convert into that new round. Um, a change of control or liquidity event, if the company sold, if it, if it winds down, um, it, can, it can trigger uh, conversion options, uh, maturity date. Sometimes uh, on a safe, they'll put, you'll put a, 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 an expiration date. So you know, if it converts in a new round, at a certain valuation cap with a discount, well, but if it never makes it there, maybe three years out, two years out, something like that, is an agreed upon maturity date where you then, uh, the investor or in the company will have options to convert. Um, conversions can be structured to be automatic or optional. Uh, usually it's triggers that allow for the conversion to happen and then it's the option of the investor to convert or not, but not always. Next instrument is a convertible debenture. It's uh, it's very, very similar to a safe. The only difference is uh, it has um, debt associated with it. So same thing converts into a specific, into equity at a specific valuation given certain triggers. Some of the pros of a convertible debenture is it defers valuation discussion. Um, it, it provides a route. So it, it, like an interim route between rounds. Sometimes we see these extension rounds where there's a valuation uh, at seed, but then their seed extension isn't quite an A. And so, you know, where are they on valuation at that point? You can structure the, the convertible debenture with a, with a more of a series A valuation to it and defer that uh, a little bit further down the line uh, as to how it actually converts. It's relatively simple, flexible deal structure, uh, and it leads to a quick, quick close. Um, the cons is that it can have limited investor projection protections, um, but you can really put what, whatever, uh, you, you care to in, in, in these deals. Um, uh, it can also leave investors stuck in debt. We, we, we've done a lot of, uh, convertible debentures through the years, and it does happen at times that you're just, uh, you know, a, a debt holder and, uh, and the company never raises again and, and, um, similar to a safe where you can just be. A little bit in no man's land. Um, overview in general general terms of a convertible debenture. Uh, again, similar to safe, but with debt. Uh, value same with the valuation cap, discount rate, conversions, triggers like a safe. As added terms, though, to address the debt. And so interest rates, this um, accrues on the amount that uh, of the debt and, and it's added to the amount that is ultimately converting into the equity. And then the conversion mechanics um, can be a little bit more flexible and uh, I guess creative uh, because it is, it is debt um, as opposed to you know, this, this figurative handshake thing. And then there is equity um, preferred shares. So this is when a this is when an investor is actually buying a percentage of your company at a specific valuation in a specific share class, preferred share class. The pros, it comes with more government governance, rights, protections. It prepares for larger rounds. It, it protects investors against later and more powerful investors. And, and US investors very much recognize it. Um, we, like I said, we've, we've done a lot of uh, convertible debentures. Um, we also like preferred share rounds. 
there's a lot of different levers that can be pulled to align goals um, again for that downside protection for us and the and the founders as well as the potential for upside it also gives protections where we can help with uh guiding the next round it prepares the founder for uh, you, you know some of the big major you know more major investors coming in as this is what they would expect uh is to have a preferred chair around so it's not the first time you're ever seeing it um or um negotiating it or or uh or servicing a, a, a an investor uh, that has has uh struck a struck a preferred chair deal with you um the cons the, the term sheet can be complex uh there's no repricing by converting into the next round. I mean, investors take the dilution right along with you. Investors are, you know, part of your company at that point. They they own a piece of your company, and if there's, you know, a down round, if there's something that happens uh, down downstream, you know, it doesn't reprice like a, conver a convertible debenture or a uh, or a um, safe. Some of the the general terms, the so overview in general terms. Um, so. Most all venture-backed companies will do a preferred share round. If if you if you go into we do, we do them at C, certainly at A, B. You get into you know some of the the more major rounds and and significant investors, it will be a preferred share round. Uh, um, very few exceptions to that. So again, you know the, the earlier you can get familiar with it and negotiate in a friendly way, um, the probably the better uh, as a company. Gives investor rights um, that mitigate risk and, and, and downside protection, as well as you know provide for that upside, as I mentioned. Uh, prepares founders for that those large institutional rounds. Some of the general terms, kind of at the core of a, a preferred share uh, term sheet is the liquidation preference. So, upon sale of a company or liqu liquidity of a company. Um, it ensures that the investor gets their purchase price, their initial investment back. And so this can be a one X, meaning they get one times their money back off the top or two or three, two or three starts to become a little bit out of market uh, in, in general during most times. But so at least the, the, the investor gets their money back first. Okay. So, but the, 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 the given that it's not participating, which I'll go into in just a minute, they then just get their their rest of their proceeds um, just like everybody else does. And so they're not double dipping. They're not taking the 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 money off the top and then you know dividing the the rest of it. That's participating. But in a liquidation preference of one x non participating, basically the um, it, it comes down to if if the if the business sells, if the liquidity event has a higher cash value than what the investor invested at, the valuation that the investor invested at, then it really doesn't make any difference to the to the founders, to the other shareholders, because the money will come off the top, but it doesn't matter. There's enough money there that everybody gets their relative share of it. Participating is different. So participating, it's the same that an investor gets back their 1x or 2x, whatever it is, off the top. But then that goes that, that goes into the into the investor's uh, pocket. And then the, the rest of it is then shared ratably, so proportionally. So you know a lot, these are less market. We don't see a lot of these uh, necessarily. And uh, you know they can be appropriate for certain scenarios, but um, it, it, a lot of people will look at it, a, a company founders will look at it as being, as an investor being paid twice. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some questions on that, which I'm happy to answer. But those are, those are two things that are core. The liquidation preference, uh, for sure is, is core to, uh, a preferred share term sheet and then participating or not is, uh, is as well. Other terms that can come in a preferred share term sheet, voting rights. So as part as investors are actually part of the business, they own part of the business, they have certain rights to vote on decisions in the company and they can attend shareholder meetings and things, but there's a lot of flexibility on how, how they vote and, um, and, and, and what it means for uh, decision-making. Um, Anti-dilution clauses. Uh, this is basically, so if, if, an investor invests at a certain valuation 
and those shares are then worth less at another at another uh, round, then the anti-dilution clause will make it so that 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 the original investors' uh, shares are then repriced back down to the new share price, which is a full ratchet, or there's formulas that can that can be used to get partial or even more shares um, at times. So it's just a repricing uh, that if if uh, if the shares go go down so uh, in, in value. Redemption rights are when let's uh, let's say that you you own a company for you know, you take a financing um, today, three years from now, and there's not been a liquidity event, it's probably not three years, but five years or more, you haven't had a liquidity event, um, a redemption right gives investors the right to ask for you to purchase their shares back. Generally speaking, you know, a lot of these young companies won't have that kind of money. And so as our old managing director used to say, it, 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 at nothing less, it um, it stimulates a conversation or an initiative. You can even structure it that uh, there'll be a committee, a liquidation committee or something at that time that goes and starts exploring options to try to get uh, shareholders paid back for uh, for their money, for their share of uh, ownership. Other terms that can be added to any instrument. Um, there's again, this this can some folks are so creative. Uh, you can you can really um, do do a lot, and they can get in some of them, some term sheets can get you know pretty crazy complex. Uh, and some people really that's you know kind of their skill set to uh, to structure deals in in a bunch of different creative ways. But these are some of the the common terms that can be added to to any instrument. Um, some conversion rights on how uh, and whose option investors convert shares, either prep shares into common shares or safes into common or or uh, or convertible debentures or any of those uh, safe or convertible debenture into um, future rounds, whatever those share classes are. Protective provisions are one that we find important. Um, so this this just prohibits company management from doing things that would impact shareholders value or uh, the, the, the fiscal nature of the business. So creating new shares would need approval, issuing dividends, uh, incurring debt in the company, selling the company, unbudgeted expenses, you know, just, just practical things to keep, uh, you know, an investor, I mean, a, a company from, you know, financing their own mortgage or, you know, doing something that just, just is, is not, uh, uh appropriate, um, with, uh, with the company money or, uh, company shares. Information rights is, um, access to the company's financial and business updates, uh, board composition and seats can be written right into the term sheet. So, you know, you may want to see, uh, a more even board or, you know, something that's uh, more reinforces the, the uh, company control of the board or, um, you know, nominate a seat or an independent that comes in to, to give more perspective or uh, depends on the situation. Preemptive rights allow for an investor, um, give, it gives that investor rights to participate in future rounds um, where uh, they can maintain their same ownership percentage. Uh, by putting more money into into the the next round of financing, and then minimum amount, amount to close, as we mentioned, um, you know, is a really important one for for us. Just in that we we do a lot of uh, work on pro formas and where the company will be, uh, where we where we specialize just in going from C to Series A successfully. We would just want to make sure that there's not a bridge to nowhere uh, that that company is you know fully financed and ready to do the play, to execute the playbook, to get to that series A profile, where it will be attractive at, uh, to a series A investor and get the highest lift, the highest uh, value that they can get uh, for, for that series A, um, a series A round. Um, but, you know, undercapitalized businesses hitting a, a roadblock or uh, running out of money before series A is, um, is not advantageous to, to uh, anybody really. Thoughts on valuation? How are we doing on time? Okay, good. Um, 
Okay, so thoughts on valuation. This is obviously a big topic for, for many people. Um, as with all terms, it's a negotiation and what's market is really what dictates. If there's somebody that's gonna pay you uh, as a company, you know, a, a high valuation, then, you know, and, and, and others won't, uh, given same terms and same quality of the investor or something. I mean, that that's what market is. Uh, structure effect, affects valuation though. Um, structure again designed to mitigate risk as well as optimize return uh, there's different ways that you can structure to, to do things like that we've done this before staged investments uh, according to milestones like almost tr like tranched money through different milestones just because we're so familiar with the, the the commercialization milestones that that go from seed to series a sometimes we'll we'll allow that to um to be like the the just the sign the signposts or the milestones along the way, and it reduces risk to investors, and it also can help reduce the dilution to existing owners because they get an opportunity to to move the valuation uh, a bit further. Liquidation preferences and redemption rights we talked about, interest and dividends, um, anti dilution provisions we've all talked about uh, how those can affect uh, valuation. Uh, performance factors certainly affect valuation. You know, what is your revenue? What's your growth rate? We talk a lot in our in our firm about quality of revenue. It, you know, is it transactional? Is it you know up and down? Is it short term contracts? Is there a lot of churn with it? Is it low average contract values? Is it uh, you know th those are all a road uh, the 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 multiple that will be consistently commanded for um, that revenue on that revenue. So um, you know some of the the more qu higher quality revenue is recurring. They're stable contracts. They're long term. They have a high average contract value. Uh, and and then we we look at unit economics as well. You know wh how much does it cost to acquire that customer? And uh, and what's the value that comes from it? You know, me immediately in that in that first contract, as well as lifetime value. You know, are they pre previously exited founders? They they certainly command a premium um, when they've done it before, and uh, and they come back uh, again. Um, you, you give a lot of credit to to them, and even you know earlier in the life cycle of of commercialization, uh, you can give a larger valuation to uh, uh, founders who have done it before. Um, so one of the things that we, we talk about a lot at seed investment, um, and we see it commonly at series A and series B is that high valuations aren't the end all. Um, so you know, follow on investors can be turned off by down rounds, uh, safes reprice themselves. Uh, some investors that pay high prices won't, won't stick around for the company. You know, if they're, if they're looking for that one in in a hundred, one in fifty, or something like that, and your 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 company is not the one that's growing uh, rapidly, um, you know they may have given you the benefit of the doubt early on, but uh, it may not be uh, on their radar anymore at, uh, at Series A and beyond. And so again, we we try to just go a little bit, we try to go rationally and pay in, for a company at a valuation that has intrinsic value at the time that we we pay for it, a multiple on quality revenue that we know will retain as they build that business. And, you know, hopefully at some point get into some kind of moat that uh, drives a, an irrational multiple uh, to an acquirer. But knowing at least that we're on the same page with, you know, why that business is worth the money that it's worth and knowing that we're not, you know, trying to play catch up um, and hoping the market timing's there and hoping those investors are still there, things like that. So just something to consider um, when you when you have, you know, maybe two term sheets in hand. Raising more than a company should does not drive up the price. I get a little bit on a soapbox with this, but um, if, if, you, if your plan, if you need to get from seed to series A with $2 million, but you want to raise 5 million, if you don't need that five million, that arbitrarily can't just shouldn't jack up a price. Um, you know, again, we we go for rational, just you know, the right size rounds for the stage that you're at, proper valuation, proper dilution, proper structure. Even worse than that, as one of the pet peeve of mine is, if you've raised, if a, if a company has raised five million in the past 
and they pivoted or they, you know, things didn't go where they thought it was going to go. And now they're at, you know, 200,000 in, in average recurring revenue in annual recurring revenue, excuse me. Um, and they say, well, this company is worth 20 million. And if you ask why, and they say, well, you know, we've already been diluted this amount from the 5 million that we raised. In my opinion, and I think a lot of people, you know, investors' opinions, um, you know, that's not to, that, that's not an advantage. Um, it's, it can be looked at as disadvantage. So, you know, just um, get, don't, just don't think that um, a previous uh, raise of a, of a, you know, hefty amount, if it didn't drive the performance of the business in some material way, um, the business is where the business is uh, performance wise, regardless of how much it's raised. And it actually can be looked at as a little bit negative. One I don't have on here is IP. Um, you know, if there is truly defensible IP uh, that, that uh, you know, has commercialization uh, potential um, or you know, licensing or something like that, um, that, can, that can certainly drive up valuations as well. But ultimately going back to the, the, the business of venture capital, um, for investors, it has to fit the return model because you know, back up that value chain of, of where the returns need to go into uh, venture capital's LPs, um, you know, ultimately that, that is where uh, valuation is or is not within certain venture capital's uh, zone. Thoughts on negotiation. Uh, I mentioned it before. It's the it's the beginning of a long term relationship. It's you know we're not selling cars to one another, and it, it doesn't matter if you you're happy with the experience or not. Um, it's it's something that requires alignment um, for 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 the long run between investors and companies, and so it's it's really important that working through this um, that you come to alignment on structure that works for everyone. Uh, while you're negotiating, many times the questions that you get on or, or the proposal that you get for a certain term, why you object to it as a company, the, 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 the follow-up question is, why do you care, right? So um, one example would be, let's say you're uh, a company, you're looking for an investment at seed, and, and you say, we're going to be profitable, um, so we don't ever need to raise a Series A, and and say so, okay, um, you know that that's a bit unique in the venture world, but you know that's fine. Um, where do you want to go from there, though? And you know if if the if the response is we want to start just developing cash flow for ourselves, that's not exactly it goes back to the to the return profiles for for venture folks. You know, that's not really how venture uh, capital firms earn their, their returns. And so that venture capitalist may say, well, I, you know, I, to see if we're aligned, how, can we put a redemption right in there? Meaning uh, that, that say, you know, four years in, if you've not raised another round or you've not sold it or, you know, you've not hurt, hit certain milestones, can we ask you to purchase these shares back? Now, if if the company responds to that and says um, no, we don't. The question becomes like, why do you care, right? Like, are we just not aligned on where we're going with this business? Um, you know, if it if it foreshadows too much that that these founders want this to be a lifestyle business that earns cash, um, and and they'll take this investor money, and there's still kind of a bridge to nowhere on that. That that money coming back to return to the to the the venture firm and the LPs, you know, it it it, it just starts to uh, gets into the mindsets of the different negotiators uh, on the different sides of the table. And so there's there's a ton of examples like that of you know even the um, liquidation preference. Um, it shouldn't be that big of a deal if we all believe that this business is going to sell for more than the price that we're paying for it today, right? The valuation today is 20 million. If, if we believe that, that uh, this uh, round of capital coming in right now is gonna drive the business to a $40 million valuation, and you know, we know that it'll keep going from there, 
that that twenty million dollar liquidation preference is long gone. Does not does not matter at all. But if a founder starts coming back and saying, um, "No, we don't want that in there," the question is going to be why. Why do you care? Like, you know, where are we going with this business? Are we on the same page with it? And so it starts to get into the mindsets. Um, a big thing on, on negotiation with these venture deals, we see, we've seen this quite a few times, is use a lawyer that's familiar with venture deals. Um, sometimes we've seen lawyers that they're large corporate counsel or they're from private equity firms or something like that. There's just different nuances with those deals. Um, it's all corporate finance, but most of like we, we work with one one partner at, at our um, at the at the firm that we use the counsel that we use, and he's done you know maybe a hundred deals for us or something like that. And most of the other firms that do venture deals that are around our ecosystem, they they know him, they know us well enough that they know where we'll each flex how we operate, why we're why we're asking for certain things or not. And um, it makes legal fees and the deal um, go much, much smoother. Sometimes if the lawyers that aren't familiar with some of the nuances of venture deals get involved, they we, you can end up negotiating really immaterial things um, at the stage that we're at and the and and the um, and the type of uh, structure of deals that we're that we're dealing with now. Um, on that note, as much as you can, when you're when you're dealing with an investor as a company and company to investor to company, discuss the business issues be, between yourselves as much as you can. Like again, why do you you know why do you care? Where's our alignment on this? You know, this is my concern from from what you're saying. This is how we can you know get around it. Work from it from a business side as much as you can, and let let lawyers and counsel you know, paper those solutions or help create those solutions. Well, we've seen sometimes if it goes the other way and, and lawyers are negotiating with each other, they're going to negotiate the finer points of the technical aspects of the, of the deal. And it, and it may not really be something that either the company or the investor actually care about from a, from a, uh, a business perspective. And it, and it will just, you know, chew up time and, and money and, and can even, even, uh, uh, put too much friction in a deal and and actually um, uh, turn it turn it sideways or uh, or even not not completed. Those are my slides tonight. So happy to um, to take some questions. It's seventeen minutes, and again, if it gets too technical, um, I'm happy to 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 chat about it offline and. Uh, and, and, you know, individual situations, uh, just don't want to spend too much time, you know, talking about individual situations of, uh, you know, your lawyer said this or whatever. Thank you so much, Craig, for sharing all your insights with us. Um, so with that, does anybody have a question? I know there were a lot of uh, technical terms discussed today. Um, does anybody have uh, or want to dig in something in particular? You'll send these slides out afterwards, of course. I know that a recording yes. will be there, but okay, yeah. So you can use yeah. those as a reference. Pat had mentioned the book Venture Deals. It's it's fantastic. Um, there's also some common uh, documents on the NACO website. I'm not sure if, who here is familiar with uh, NACO, uh, the the um, Angel Association that's national across Canada. Um, they've got a, a, a repository, a library of common docs that uh, can be also very helpful to you. Great, we have a question here from Kara Wolf. How do you determine initial valuation on an R&D company? Yeah, we, um, we, we, we see those. So you're talking about something that has no, no revenue. Uh, I mean, it depends on the nature of the company, but you're, you're speaking about something that's more IP centric, like a deep, a deep tech company. Cybersecurity AI. Deep yes. Tech. Deep tech, it, it it comes to a technical evaluation of it, and you know what can be done with that technology, how it creates market opportunity, moats around it, commercialization potential. From our perspective, when we look at businesses like this, and we're we're different. There are there are 
specific deep tech investors um, that, that we that we know and, and work with uh, that are a little bit more familiar with uh, IP and you know the technical side of of, of uh, businesses um, and will invest in pre-revenue and things. From our side of it, what we look for is again you know what the mode is, how it can be commercialized, but also the time to that commercialization because uh, it all comes down to capital efficiency, capital intensity that's required. So, you know, if you've got a, you're talking about cybersecurity, AI, you know, I assume it's software, not hardware. Um, likely it can be commercialized, you know, fairly soon. So it's it's still an assessment of like where that will go revenue wise, um, you know, way, whether you can get customer traction, some of those unit economics and contract values and things like that, that I was going into before. Um, but if it's a, a medical device that has, you know, regulatory approvals and things like that, there, there are different investors that will go into those. They're, they're generally long time horizons to commercialization and quite capital intensive to do it. And so you, know, you have to discount against that. Some of them are IP, you know, de-risking along the way or, or even like regulatory approval stages that can de-risk it along the way. and. So it can be valued at, at that. So I'm not sure if that that's a, a full answer to you. Um, I, I I would have to probably see you know what it is that you're specifically talking about to try to give uh, more specific uh, advice on that. Uh, we're getting quite a few questions here in the chat, so uh, so we'll go through them. Uh, also, feel free to speak up. It's not uh, doesn't have to be on the chat only. Um, we'll we'll start here quickly with Tony Festa. Uh, any recommendations on where people can go to learn the specifics of the venture deal structures with examples? Yeah, Venture Deals is a is a fantastic book. It's the Bible on it. And then as I was mentioning, the, the NACO website, which uh, maybe we can circulate that also when we send out the deck. I'll put it in the deck, um, those two things. Um, the NACO, they did, they did a great job a few years ago about um, getting some common documents together. So they've got... The, the safe uh, convertible to venture and uh, preferred share term sheet. I think they have a common share term sheet in there too. And they go through a specific education, like they go through each section of a term sheet in 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 those um, specifically describing what those terms are. And then there's templates of term sheets that you can take right from it. So you'll get the education and the the documents all in one. And I'll put those in the in the uh, PowerPoint slides. Great. Uh, question from Kelly Hall. Uh, what are your comments or thoughts on equity transactions with common shares instead of preferred shares? Yeah. So, so perhaps you can explain what the difference is as for well sure. for those people that don't know the difference between common and preferred. Yeah. So common shares, I actually had a slide in here on it. I took it out. I, I can I can pop it back on, in when, when I send this deck out. But so common shares are... Um, like founder shares, they're just they're they're uh, they don't have any rights necessarily to them. No protector provisions, no liquidity preferences, uh, anything like that. The challenge with common shares to investors is that a future investor um, can can really impact uh, the the value and the and the and the the, the nature of of uh, those common shares, and so. The, you, you just don't have any protections against future any of the things that I mentioned, all of the terms that I mentioned. I mean, you can you can bake in terms around common share deals, but by the time you're done with that, it may as well be a preferred share deal. So um, yeah, that's really it. They're just they're just kind of naked shares. Thanks. Great. Uh, let's go here to Peter Irvin. Hi, thank you uh, for the uh, the talk and the presentation. So very very interesting. Um, quick question: um, wh What do you see as differences between typical deal structures in Canada versus in the U.S. in in the Valley and and so on? Do you see any differences from uh, from an investor's perspective? And if so, what are they and why? Uh, and how has that maybe developed over the last ten years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll start with one of the fundamental differences that I see with U.S. and Canadian investors. 
um, the, the, the concept of like a scout check uh, here, you know, maybe it's a $250,000 investment into a early stage business, a pre-seed business or something like that, just so that that venture firm can watch how that company matures and, you know, potentially have another shot to invest in it later. 250 would be pretty reasonable here uh, for the size funds that, that Canadian venture firms are. In the United States, um, you you know add 10x, 100x to some of those size. Uh, I mean, at least you know you get into the billion dollar funds, and their scout checks can be a couple million, which look like an entire seed round, and they may do it on a safe, um, where you know we may want a little bit more protector provisions on that, a little bit more downside protection, a little bit more alignment with the founders. The, the challenge with that is um, it still is a scout check, right? So some of those U.S. investors will not find it interesting if you're not growing uh, as well. And so I, if you look at those fundamental differences between the two, two types of investors, you'll see more conservative deal sheets here, I believe, with, you, with Canadian investors, but a lot more alignment with those companies for the longer run and even through tough times. And, and uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the one in hundred that is, you know, gonna be a billion dollar company. Uh, for us, at least we will, we're okay to, to get those, uh, that downside protection and, and work with founders to have wins at different stages along the path where, and, and we structure our deals as, uh, accordingly where a U.S. investor might be a little bit light on that structure, at least initially, um, but it, their involvement or their their future involvement could be just as light or just as you know questionable. Once they get into real rounds, it's always pref, pref terms though. Um, once they get into you know a Series A or a Series B, once they do pick you as a winner, um, they they will they will structure the the deals uh, quite um, quite similar to us in terms of preferred share rounds so so the the structural difference is then mostly on downside protection basically. yeah okay yeah okay thank you thank yeah. you yeah, yeah and, we're I gonna think, and i think it's just Sorry, because, right? yeah with their with their return model it can be you know they don't need to we we want to materialize each company we deal with right we want to work with you on wins all the way along and i think um some of the u.s companies that are looking at uh you know, just just those those few that are that are just nailing it. Thank you. Great question from Celia Wang here. Um, founders usually value their companies higher than VCs. How do you convince a founder to take a VC valuation? Some of these structural things that we were mentioning. You know, is it a convertible to venture that has a valuation cap that we can both live with? Uh, is it tranching it along? You know, a little bit less money now get to certain milestones and then, you know, you can move your valuation up uh, from there. Um, you know, other anti-dilution, there's, there's different ways to structure things so that you can kind of close that gap. Um, and, and ultimately it, you know, just may not be uh, in the right zone. Uh, you know, once again, market is market. Like if you've got other term sheets in hand that, uh, that, you know, will we'll pay you a higher valuation and you're comfortable with, you know, how those, how that venture firm invests, then, you know, then that's the valuation. So, um, but it has to come with some kind of rationale, you know, just thinking that uh, your business is worth a certain price because, you know, you have to, you have to back that up with something either, you know, other people are paying that and they're ready to pay you or, you've got the revenue and you know that this is the multiple and you know where your business is going, like something has to substantiate that. Um, so um, happy to chat with you about your situation if that's helpful. Great, now we're gonna take a question from Max. Hi Craig, thanks a lot for, for the talk. I had a follow on question on the pref shares. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind um, if I was looking from a company perspective, and I think the example that you gave is, is totally fair, like why would I care? Um, 
the main worry from my perspective, and I would love to know whether you can shed some light on that, is how would an investor in a follow-on round look at that if they saw that in the previous round, an investor already has prep shares? Is that potentially affecting it negatively, or is that a very common thing, and therefore they, they, they wouldn't be much an eye on it? No. Um... No, as, as long as the company is, if, if it's an up round yeah. and, 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 you know, it's going into a, a healthy, you know, raise a, a good substantial raise, it's just another, another pref share. And they'll, the new pref shares stack on top of the old pref shares. So it, they, they get preference over the preferred shares that, you know, so C, C preferred, A preferred, and then it just keeps going okay. uh, from there. And so you know, they'll do a little bit of their own restructuring uh, yeah. during that time. But I, I think that they they can look at it favorably because it's not the first time they're going to be dancing with a founder um, on this type of negotiation and, you know, their understanding of why they're doing what they're doing and, you know, what the terms mean to each parties and how to gain that alignment. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's negative. I think it's, uh, it's uh, more alignment. Awesome. Thank you. I have a question from Sammy here. Um, what are the kind of predatory deal structures for founders to keep in mind? Sorry, some of the what? Predatory deal oh. structures for founders to uh, keep in mind. Yeah. So if you see a, a term sheet that comes across that has a, you know, 3x uh, uh, liquidation preference and it's participating or something like that, that means that the, the investor is going to get three times their money back and then share proportionally in the re remaining um, proceeds, something like that could be predatory, but, you know, market is market too. So, you know, again, that's why you got to be careful not to give, you know, bump your valuation up too high early on just because you can get it because down the line, if you're, if you didn't make it there and you're running out of money, and the business didn't perform where where it should have been, you know, market is going to be potentially predatory at that point. And so again, just go go rational with it, especially in times like this where, you know, we're, we're not we're not going to see the the frothy rounds that we once saw. Some of the things um, I was going to put this in. Um, one thing to to always be aware for uh, that's somewhat predatory or just I mean the nature of a strategic investor. Let's say that you've got a big, huge customer, um, you know, I don't know, EMC or, or Google's your biggest customer. And then Google Ventures comes over and says, you know, we, we like you so much, we're going to invest in your business as well. But we want first right of refusal on it. That is going to leave you almost unfinanceable um, by another venture capital firm. Because that means that anytime uh, you go to sell, sell Google can step in there, right? And so just be careful of the, the, the interests of different firms, right? So there's firm, there's there's VC firms that have different profile models. They have different ways that they'll interact with businesses that aren't performing. They have different ways that they invest, you know, early and, and, and go through the stages. And then you've got strategic firms and, you know, they, they're looking for not just economic returns, they're looking to strategically fit you into their business somehow. And so watch for, uh, I don't want to say predatory, but, you know, misalignment on where you want to go and where your uh, venture investors want to go and where that, you know, business wants to acquire you at some point. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Uh, thanks, Craig. Um, I just know we are here on time. Craig, do you have a few more minutes to stay on? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So for those of you that have to drop off, I wanted to let you know that we're going to be sending out a very short survey so that you can let us know what you thought about these sessions and also about what other topics you would like to learn or dig in more. So we'd really appreciate if you guys can take a minute and answer that. Uh, so on that, uh, Amara, you're next. Hi, thank you, Craig and Omi for, uh, for hosting. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm sorry, I came in late. I'm not sure if this was already addressed, but I'm seeing that the, that VCs are leaning or investors in general leaning towards safe notes rather than convertible notes. 
Uh, why is that? It's it's just that it depends on the type of investor and the stage of the company and how much money is going in and you know what what the dynamics of the market are right now. Um, we we did cover that a bit. Uh, I don't know. Did you did were you here for the the section on safes? I wasn't, unfortunately. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe look through the presentation when you're done. You can you can see some of the pros and cons and and some of the risks associated with it. But the long and short is, you know, during times when a quick round needs to come together, it's a hot mm -hmm. market. Safes can do the trick. Um, I think that they become inappropriate for too big rounds, too late stage rounds, um, but also they can be a bit risky um, when there's less confidence that there's going to be bigger rounds down the line as well. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it, it all comes to, you know, size around uh, stage of the company, type of investor you're dealing with and market dynamics at that point and, and the projection of uh, the market dynamics uh, in the future for investors coming into your business. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Craig. Mm -hmm. We have another question here that comes from Omi, but it's not me. Oh. Uh, but uh, the question says, uh, can you talk more about the anti-dilution clauses and what are the best practices for using them? Sure. Um, so anti-dilution can just gain alignment on repricing a deal for the most part. Uh, so a, a best practice from an investor standpoint would be to uh, you know, put an anti-dilution in there, which is probably a full ratchet saying, if, uh, if I pay $10 a share now and your next raise is, you know, misses the mark and is at $8 a share, then we would like our shares repriced at that. That's from the best practice from a, an investor standpoint, you know, might not be from the company standpoint, um, but it, again, it's, you know, again, why do you care? Like, did, did you go in too high of a valuation now? It's, you know, I, I, I say your business is worth $10 a share. You say it's worth $20 a share. I say, okay, um, you know, then we'll reprice it if, if you don't make that mark. And so again, it's like, why do you care? If, if somebody asked earlier, how do you, how do you align with, uh, your, perception of your valuation versus a VC's perception of valuation, that's one way to do it. If you think your business is worth, you know, X amount, then if, if it goes down in value or you can't, you know, get a, a round, an up round from there, then, you know, it'll be uh, your risk. Um, you, so you, you get that high valuation today, but you're, you're on the hook down the line if it, um, if it, if it doesn't sustain. So does that answer your question? Uh, I don't know who that question came from, but uh, yes, it does. Okay, okay perfect. <laughs> it just shows up as Omi, so it doesn't have a name. Um, okay, the next question we have here is from Randall. And I was wondering, Randall, if you mind um, going off mute and asking your question, it's just not very clear um, from my side. Sure, hi. Hi, Craig. Um, hey. Great. Great presentation. Um, my question was uh, about um, selling ARR, ARR to um, to investors as as a non dilutive financing, or sort of moving things along. Um, what your thoughts are on on that way of financing? Um, okay, there's no there's no better way to finance your company than customer revenue. Um, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering how, how to, how do venture folks feel about that? Do they feel it's competitive to what, what their, the, the, their money that's going in or, or do they see it as a positive thing or? Oh, interesting question. I mean, it's a positive thing. I mean, it depends on, you know, where you are in that alignment cycle. So, you know, if, if you don't need money from a, a venture capital firm, you, you hold, you hold more power there. And so, you know, keep doing what you're doing, collect those checks, you know, if you're running the business lean and you can, you continue, you can continue to grow the business in a meaningful way through your own revenue. Um, you know, then you, then you take a venture investment, you know, as you see needed and dictate the terms that 
that you think the market will bear. Um, but, and so that's the only way that I think that they can look at it as competitive is that they, you know, a venture firm that you don't need them. Uh, but, you know, ultimately it's, it's only advantageous to the profile of the business. So, you know, they so, would, it, would be a, it would be a love hate thing, I suppose. Yeah. More value, uh, you know, down the road, uh, you know, in the interim, it's a great way to finance, but down the road uh, with, uh, you know, a real scale of the business, uh, other more sophisticated, you know, like venture capital would be needed to to get to where you want to go, but just sort mm -hmm. of see, it, see it as an interim measure. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Congratulations. If that's your scenario. Um, next question here, we have uh, Doug Hall. Do you, we like to go off mute? Yes, thank you very much. Um, my question is, um, we're a, a SaaS startup, FinTech. We've been out there for about two years now. We've finished development of our technology, filed patents. Those are being issued on Tuesday. And we've been working with Carta to manage our stock and our uh, employee option plan. Mm -hmm. And they've given us an evaluation. And I'm wondering, how do VCs look at those types of valuations? Do they take those into consideration or do you have your own method of uh, doing that? Yeah, own, own method. Um, I, I'm, I've never seen a Carter valuation. Um, I've never, I've never uh, heard it as a, as a reference in any deal that I've been part of. Carter, uh, Carter is a- uh, No, I know what Carter oh, I know what Carter is. is. Yeah. They, they have a new valuation division. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, so yeah, not, not so sure. Valuations can be such a, you know, thumb in the wind. And so, uh, you know, each, each investor is going to do their own diligence and figure out their own pricing within it. And again, it's to do with their return model and, you know, what they see in the market and what their thesis is and, you know, what you have for, you know, competitive advantage and where they think their business is going and where it's going to lift in value over time. All the things we mentioned. So um, I don't think that that would be super material unless, you know, there's something super unique about the IP. You know, it's, it's patented and, you know, you can get some kind of, um, you know, third party report on, you know, the uniqueness of it or something like that. I mean, it would be taken into consideration, I suppose, but um, you know, it's a little bit more on the, on the deep tech side, a, a deep tech side, I guess. And um okay, yeah. that, that, that's great I, I appreciate that answer and uh, uh great presentation thanks yeah sorry that's not a better answer but um yeah maybe if you want to follow up i i could probably take a look and see where you're at and give you a little bit more insight that would be awesome thanks very much craig okay we have a question from brown, uh, brown Joel. would you like to go off mute that was a very specific question. So I think it would be great if you um, asked it Thank yourself. You. Uh, um, so I have a question about valuation. It's, it's one of probably others have asked as well. So we have a company which is um, Bootstrap and we are ready to scale. We have three um, enterprise clients who have paid uh, for our solution. So, but we need uh, to scale. We need um, obviously some, uh, external funds. Uh, so again, how, again, in the journey of this fundraising, how to value it so that I don't lose so much, you know, that, you know, I don't give up so much and then, you know, the, that kind of question. So what's the best, best way to go forward on this one? So uh, how to yeah. valuation, do valuation, yeah. Yeah, thinking, thinking back to, to the, the thoughts on valuation slide that I had, you know, it sounds like the 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 value the 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 quality of your revenue is is fairly high. Um, you know, enterprise clients. I'm not sure if you're comfortable saying what the average contract value is. So for each client, um, we generate around 200k per year, uh, kind of thing. Uh, because the tools they buy, the tool licenses is one cost, and then obviously we are the ones who have to implement it so there is two sides of thing at this moment so eventually yeah, yeah so uh yeah that's how it is right now 
So you are at um, three customers, 200,000 uh, annually each recurring, 600,000 ARR in the business with three customers. That's, that's, that's nice revenue. That's a, that's a nice profile. So, you know, I would think easily uh, you should be able to get 10 X for that um, over that revenue. Right. And so, you know, if you're looking at a six, seven million dollar valuation, I don't know where you're you're thinking to be at it with it. But you know, even though you've got three customers and they're paying well, I don't know how you got them, but you know, where that sales process is going so that you can get a repeatable sales process, get into some kind of sales process fit. You know, you what you might want to consider doing is getting a, a reasonable valuation that you can, you know, that around that 10x or something with a with a venture capital firm, taking a little bit less money. Um, so that it doesn't dilute you so much more to that, like, you know, milestoning thing. So take a little bit less money, get to those next, you know, you know, few customers where you can show repeatability of it. Now you're going to be at a, a profile of likely series A uh, or seed extension where you can pop up the value value even more. And you, know, you can even write that into the contracts where there's contemplation of additional uh, dollars put in once you get to certain milestones of revenue, then you can have a higher valuation at that point. Again, the 10x. You know, maybe you double your revenue, then you take another another little tranche of dollars. That leads you to Series A. You know, you're in you're in a good spot there, though. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say is don't don't fight too hard for you know some irrational or not to say irrational, but something too high over over that. Just just you know um, bite it off along the way is what yeah. I would say to do. And, uh, and then you don't get it, uh, you know, over your skis on it and uh, you can get good alignment with a, with a good value add investor and, and make your way to series A and, 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 you know, mitigate some of that dilution and, and risk along the way. And um, yeah, it sounds like an interesting business, actually. You, I, you. I, we'll take a look at it if you, if you want. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Amara, will you let, do you have another question? Final question. I've been seeing a lot of tools that are meant for angels, syndicates, and as well as VC funds that are meant to either give them more data or more insight into the industry, just for the DD process. Um, my question is how how often is that is it that VC funds are actually using those tools? Can you or do they have that? their own internal? Um, so let's say PitchBook, a lot of data insight there. Um, there's some UK based tools that give you insights as well. Data rooms um, allow mm -hmm. you to do deals on their platforms as well. I see. Um, yeah. Some firms may, I mean, obviously, you know, if they're in business, some firms are using them. We use PitchBook um, mm -hmm. and we do have, you know, access to some folks that can pull reports and things like that for just market, you know, sizing and, uh, and, 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 um, competitive analysis and things like that, but we don't really go into, we, we get prospected quite often. I get emails often of saying, you know, we do diligent diligence through a platform or, you know, it's outsourced or it's a technology, you know, data program or something like that. Right. I, don't, I don't really entertain many, uh, any of them. Uh, so, <laughs> I, but others may, you know, may like we're also early stage, right? So even with PitchBook, many, you know, a lot of these firms haven't raised before, so there's not a whole lot we can look at. Mm -hmm. You know, even into Series B, Series D, C, D, things like that. There's there's previous rounds. There's you know more market data. There's more just more data to go off of, right? Right. Uh, the business, and so and certainly if you get into like you know bigger bigger rounds than that, there's, there's probably more that you can analyze. Um, and so that's why we don't necessarily entertain them. So I may not have a ton of insight on, on some of those tools downstream, but we for sure. in a couple so of then you could, you could say that it's typically, typically kept in house. The DD process is kept, kept amongst the, the LPs, um, yeah. and just done with the founding team as well. Yeah. At, at okay. our stage, um, you know, maybe mm -hmm. I, th I think most firms, even, even downstream. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. So I think that was the last question. Um, so Craig, thank you very much for, I know it is 7 p.m. or later now for you in Toronto. So we really appreciate your time and uh, we will be sending out the presentation along with the recording later on. For sure. Um, oh, there's one more question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. 
I'll answer that. It's a, that's an interesting one. How much how much of your job would you categorize as mentor or coach for the founders? Uh, we our our team we're all former operators, and um, it's really interesting because some operators don't transition to VCs to investors all that well. They you know either want to be too hands on or they project what they think what they believe they would do in a situation like. You know, I'll just go in there and close that deal. Well, that that founder may not have that same you know skill set or whatever. And so, um, as an operator, I, I I did well with some businesses, but I look at some of the operators that we that we finance now, and they're just brilliant folks. Uh, they're just so good, and so it's their business. It's it's their decisions to make. Um, we're there to guide, show some pattern recognition, introduce them to some folks, you know, uh, show them uh, different insights that we can get along, you know, their journey and, and the playbook toward a successful series A and, you know, different, uh, minefields to avoid and, and different, and different things like that. A lot of stuff that we talked about here today, but it is very much, uh, a support role um, what I do. I'm, I'm not in there steering companies around or, uh, you know, making decisions for these folks or anything like that. It is very much a mentor, uh, role. And, um, and, and I, I, you know, I love it like that. And, um, and the, and the founders that I end up working with, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're brilliant operators and, and we work well together like that. And, you know, I'm not sure that we could do each other's jobs even if we wanted to. Sounds like we have one more question here from Atul. Uh, what are your thoughts and advice on individuals who are new to VC? Uh, there's one of the things that's pretty cool about VC, in my opinion, is that folks come from all walks of life. Uh, you can have former operators, you can have finance folks, you can have people that have you know, just falling into it, you know, from, from an internship, you know, they're, they were in something totally different or a degree that was totally different. You know, you can obviously have your, you know, your, your cadence of business schools and things like that, but there are a lot of ways to get into it. Um, at some point to be an operator is really key, like to have that empathy for what these folks are facing on the other side um, is really helpful as you invest and you and you and you deal with them and uh, and you see what they're going through and even what their families you know are going through with them um, and and what their lives are like uh, are like and you know what it's like to raise money and to uh, negotiate these things and to wake up on good days and bad days, fully convicted in your business, yet also, you know, take advice and, you know, shore up the, the areas that you're not strong in and be a student in your gaps and all that. It's, it's a phenomenal skill set, uh, set of skills uh, that these, that these operators have. And so to have some of that empathy is super helpful. And then it's being able to you know, what Tony's question was, be that mentor, be, be that guiding help for them in a meaningful way um, without, uh, you know, stepping on any toes. As, as early in, in, in VC, it's, it's the operator path, though, that I would say, um, you know, if you can get early access to a, a venture firm, even if it's an admin role or something like that, and you know that that's what you want to do, and you get in there and you can get alignment with partners or something like that's a good way to go um but you know while you're while you're young and um you have a little bit more risk appetite go, go to a go to a startup and try to play as meaningful a role as you can there with the founders and uh, maybe even try to start something yourself not everybody has a skill set and personality for it and I, and I get that but um it's you know it's really insightful for your, for you uh Later in your career as a as a venture capitalist to uh, have been on that side of the table. First, on that note, any last words, Greg, to wrap up the call? I don't think so. Um, I appreciate the the questions, and yeah, you know, I appreciate the time you, you spent here. And and uh, you know, if there's there's more that we can do to to help, uh, you know, let us know. Um, again, we look for that alignment, and and uh, 
well, you know, we're we're eventually on this on the same side of the table uh, once we get in a deal together. So, if uh, if there's something we can do to help, let us know. Awesome. Thanks again, Craig, and thanks again, everybody. Okay. Thank you so much. That was so helpful. Oh, awesome. Good. Uh, have a good night. have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Yep. You're welcome. Bye.